Welcome to the Franchise Woman Podcast, where passion and purpose collide, profits are made, and relationships forged. I'm Rebecca Monet, CEO and Chief Scientist at Zorical Profiles. I'm here with my co-host, community advocate, speaker, author, and entrepreneur, Tracy Kawa. Tracy, we have a very interesting interview uh, coming up. Um, as we found out from our pre-interview already, uh, Spencer Sabat Sabatasso. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. The dynamic VP of franchise development at the Red Chicks, whose extensive background in hospitality industry and franchise development has positioned him as a thought leader in the field. Spencer's journey began in the culinary arts, owning and operating successful restaurants since the mid 1990s and holding key roles such as VP of operations, president and CEO. His deep industry knowledge combined with his hands-on extensive experience as both a franchisee and a franchisor provides him with a unique perspective on what takes what it takes to build and sustain a thriving uh, franchise. So I can't wait to hear your story. Thanks, Spencer, for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. And whoever you just described sounds like a really good guy. He is a good guy. I, I'm not sure. If it, is this our interview? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Got it. Okay, I'm warning you guys, this guy's trouble, okay? But <laughs> we're going to pull out of him some words of wisdom. So welcome. Thank you welcome, very much. Welcome. Yeah, Thank we you. want to hear uh, all the details of uh, but I think Rebecca and I would probably most likely want to hear about your early childhood and your your formative years. Well, I was born a poor black child, and no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, Morgan, I love it. Yeah, I was. Uh, you know, I was. I I grew up in the mean streets of uh, Newport Beach over here in Big Canyon. You know, tough childhood. Um, now, in all seriousness, I grew up here in California. Um, to, um, you know, Lewis and Mary Sabatasso, they, uh, my dad was, you know, a very successful, um, businessman, he owned Sabatasso foods. I think he retired when he was about 48. Yeah. Um, nice. I think our pizza is still in Costco today. Um, I think Schwann enterprise still owns it. Um, so I was, you know, I was kind of, I grew up in a, you know, um, you know, we had, we had, uh, wealth for sure, but you know, it was, it was a, a, a household that was, you know, riddled with imperfection, you know, two people doing the best that they knew how to do and, and raising a family and all that. And, you know, as a result of that, you know, there were some, you know, things that happened in that household that were, you know, not, not the best. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, my parents were doing the best that they could. And, um, and I know that today, um, you know, and at a very, at a, uh, you know, very early age for myself, it was, you know, kind of a, uh, very toxic environment. Um, I had discovered, um, we had a full bar at our house. I mean, literally a full bar. Um, and, you know, I discovered alcohol at a very young age. And, you know, the second I, uh, put that first drink in me, I was like, Whoa, <laughs> hello, where have you been all my life? And so right away, immediately felt, you know, I was 12 feet tall, confident, you know, and all of those things. Um, you know, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I started off early and, um, you know, uh, alcohol and drug addiction, that's a big part of my story in my life for sure. And I'm open and honest about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, had some various levels of success throughout my career until I was about, um, 40 years old. And at 40 years old, um, I had a wife, I had a home, I had a nanny and a housekeeper for all of like 2,200 square feet. And I was running around doing all this stuff. And unfortunately, I burned all of that to the ground. Um, you know, I went through a divorce, a two and a half million dollar bankruptcy, loss of my children, loss of everything, and just kind of beaten to the ground. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to have relationships in my life that I was introduced to um, a program. Um, and in that program, you know, I had a kind of a new lease on life. Um, you know, I removed the alcohol and drugs from my life and then I'm just left with me, flawed character defects and so on and so forth. So over the last 
basically 15 years I've been unwinding that and, you know, downloading new software and really, you know, learning how to live life on life's terms. Um, and it's been, it's been quite a journey, um, but it's been an unbelievable journey and I'm, you know, extraordinarily grateful for that journey. For sure. Wow, what a yeah. story. So yeah. you discovered alcohol pretty young. Pretty uh, young. Basically, it turned into some kind of addiction. Sounds like you had a similar drive as your your parents did to have success. Um, yeah, I think at the age of, so I, I had already, by the time I was 24, I already had a degree in hospitality management and another degree in culinary arts from CIA. Um, some childhood friends of mine, um, you know, kind of famous restaurant tours around here. They wanted to open up a store in Newport Beach. Mm -hmm. And the son and I always talked about being in business together. So I think I, I owned my first bar when I was 25 or 26. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I was with that group for, I had about, I had three stores um, with them. I, I think I, I was there till about 30 ish, 31 or 32, something like that. Um, and then I sold out, I, you know, I was very upset that I wasn't a millionaire already, even though I was making a lot of money, but I wasn't quite where I wanted to be. And I left that, um, again, not sober, not thinking clearly, but I left that in my blind ambition. I jumped on, you know, I jumped aboard to a franchise that really had no business franchising. And I jumped, you know, all over that. And I signed on for about 10 stores and I was going to do this thing. And then I discovered that they didn't know what they were doing on any step of the level. They would basically bring on anybody as a franchisee and they didn't have any of the support really that was needed. And so I learned a tremendous value um, in that. You know, I kind of fumbled around in the restaurant industry and and then at, you know, 40, I finally, um, you know, I burned everything to the ground and I decided I need to make a life change. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I do not want my children to grow up in this environment. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, um, you know, I went through literally, you know, a, that two and a half million dollar bankruptcy, divorce, loss of my all this stuff that I had caused. Um and, you know, I needed a new way of life, like all the way around. So I got sober and started really working hard on that. Um, yeah. And I think during that time, I did everything from, I got my real estate license. I did financial services. I have insurance license. I did drug and alcohol treatment. I did everything under the sun. I even tried to dabble back in the restaurant industry, consulted for, you know, mother's market, just all these different things. And I was like, you know, what, what am I doing? You know, I have this education. I know this business so well, you know, for me, I did not want to be back in that business where I had 700 employees and doing all that, you know, but I know it so well, and I kind of want to help other people be successful. And so for me, the natural progression being that I've owned and operated so many stores um, in my career, and I've done it from the dirt up and I had all this experience, you know, was, was franchise sales and development. Um, so a friend of mine, you know, that was, I've been in the space for many, many years. Um, he, uh, I, you know, I called him and we had a good conversation and he, he approached me a couple different times throughout my career and said, you ought to come do what, what we're doing. And so I got a great foundation there. Um, and I was with them for about, I don't know, a year and a half or so. And then another kind of was sort of recruited by another brand to come in there. And I, you know, and I started that journey and, you know, had incredible success with these guys and they just kind of, kept rolling from there. And, you know, now I'm working with um, Red Chicks. Amazing. Great. Amazing timeline. Um, I'm curious about something because it, it sounds like you've been through so much, you've tried so much, you've experienced yeah. so much that any one of those things, any single one of our listeners would be able to relate to. I'm kind of, I'm kind of wondering about the ambition side of things because the one thing that it sounds like that you had from uh, pre, like from addiction to post recovery is this timeline uh, of ambition. Like you've always had ambition. It sounds like you were always an ambitious person. You saw your parents successful. You wanted that success. What do you think was the difference in the way you went about your ambition from 
when you were addicted to when you were in recovery and after? I think the major difference is, is um, what I discovered is money is definitely not going to bring me happiness. It's just, it's just not the deal. And I'm not, I refuse to um, make money the driving force in what I do. You know, I think the big progression for me is when I gave my life over um, and gave it over to the program that I work, you know, to my higher power and all that, I have a different why. You know, and that why now is, you know, to be of, you know, love and service, um, sort of a code. So, you know, when I'm looking at my success now, now I know that if I'm putting the other person first in a, in a respect, um, two things that are most important in my life for my relationship with myself and my higher power. So without that, everything else doesn't work. So I'm sort of right with those two. Um, but the, the, the difference, the switch, the paradigm switch for me was... You know, I I want to really, I want to help people be successful. I want to help them make the right decision for them. And a lot of times it's just not the right decision for them. And I'll walk them through that. I mean, I've talked people out of doing certain things because I just didn't think it was going to be right for them as it relates to this industry. Um, but my, you know, I, I want to see them succeed. So I don't just hand people off, you know, mm -hmm. and say, here you go. Now you guys deal with this. This is your issue and problem is I really try to establish a relationship with my franchisees and guide them in every, you know, every single facet of the business because I have so much experience. And so, you know, if I do a good job at that and, and, and if, you know, if I make my why about them, you know, um, I, as a result of that, I've had success because I really put them first. If I'm putting myself first and my blind ambition first, I lose every time, you know, and that's probably that one most valuable lesson you know, that for me, and that's just my experience. It's not mm -hmm. a lot of people's reality, but for me, I know that if I truly look at everything from that perspective, you know, I show up, I do a good job. I walk them through the process. And if I have success, it's great. I think it's more a result of doing those things. Yeah. So a massive shift, your why shifted from, I'm going to be a billionaire to how can I serve others and help them do what's right for them. Mm -hmm. um, I would also think it's more emotionally and spiritually satisfying than just the self gratification that we would get through making millions or drinking too much, let's say. I would think that this would be much more fulfilling the way you're looking at the world today. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and, and, you know, I've worked in a couple, you know, circumstances where, you know, I, I've said, listen, um, you know, I, I, I kind of know the playing field. I know what's, I know where you guys are at right now. Um, and that I know that I'm going to bring you guys a lot of money, you know, kind of um, what my expectation is, because I always want to make sure that I identify the sandbox is that you're going to bring in the right people in these different buckets. You're going to bring in the right ops people when you need it. You're going to bring in the right marketing people, procurement, all of these different categories, design, construction, all these things. Um, if I go down this road with you, because at the end of the day, when you're in this business, when you're a franchisor and you decide to franchise, the day that you accept dollar one, your whole why changes. Your whole why now is to support the franchisee, period. Everything else doesn't mean anything. you know. And I learned that from my mentor, um, John Gallardi, who founded Wiener Schnitzel, he's since passed a few years ago, loved him to death, my dad's best friend. But, you know, what I learned from him, he said, my whole existence in life is to support the franchisee. And that's it. That's the fiduciary responsibility I have to them. So um, in working with brands, I make sure they understand that responsibility. And if I kind of get that, mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, it's not someone I want to work with. What's interesting to me is you stayed in the food business your parents of course starting there you continue to stay in the food business one of the things that when i was looking up a little bit about you that i thought was very interesting and i wondered if you could address it is your philosophy around quality versus quantity um as it relates to franchisees that you want to bring in uh to the red chicks you well, you know, what's funny is that you said that and I and I didn't really think about this until you said you just brought up all that. Um, you know, I'd, like I've said, I've done 
everything that I've done so many different businesses. It's crazy. I think really I'm in the people business. You know, when I look at that, I really think I'm in the people business. So I, I, I truly try to establish a relationship with, every single franchisee I bring into whatever system it is. So I have this relationship with them mm -hmm. and I let them know that I'm not going anywhere. I'm here just because we may be done together. We're not done together. I really try to do that. And so, you know, I think with every brand and everything that I work with, I want to have that same, I want to have that same good working relationship. You know, if I don't like the people I'm working with, I'm not going to do a good job and I'm not going to be there for very long. I just, I just know it. So, you know, I, I really think that, you know, it's more of, it's more of a relationship than, mm -hmm. than what you've described. Now, as it relates to the specifics of a brand and all that, yes, I look for stuff like, you know, I think the product is the best in the system. I look for unit economics. I look at the, the people behind the brand, you know, where are you guys wanting to go? Um, I've got to like all of those things. There's a bunch of different boxes that need to be checked before I'm going to sign on a brand. I mean, I, you know, to be honest with you, I've, I've sold brands um, very briefly, but I've sold brands that I've discovered that I, I know I sold this thing, but I don't, I don't believe in this brand. I don't feel good about it. I don't think I can sell it. I mean, and, and, you know, and that, that, you know, a couple of brands. Um, so, you know, I, I, and I look at that and I don't feel good about it. And so I, you know, I, I, I sort of say, you know what, I don't think this is the best fit for either of us. And I move on. Beautiful. Getting back to the franchisee, Spencer, how do you know if it is somebody that you want to work with? How do you know if it's somebody that you don't want to work with? Well, when I, so, you know, it's, what's funny is you, you know, there's methodically, and I learned this through one of the companies I was working with is they had like a long 10 step process or something like that. And there was key indicators within that 10 step process that will let you know what kind of individual they are. You know, if they're barking at doing certain little things along in the process, probably know they're not going to be the best franchisee because they're going to do things their own way and not really follow a process and a procedure. So there's little indicators along the way, you know, communication, um, you know, are we engaged with each other? Eye contact, um, you know, uh, you know, look, do they have a sense of humor, you know, and, you know, which is, which is big. And, you know, Tracy, that's why I'm not sure how you work with Rebecca, but that's your deal. It's not my deal. Um, so, cause I know Rebecca does not have a sense of humor at all, but anyway, no. so, um, <laughs> I know you do stop and I'm kidding. So, you know, but I look at, but I look at all of those things, um, you know, and it's like, is, is this someone that I would, you know, that I would want to hang out with outside of this relationship? Is this someone that I know is going to be right for the brand? So when I understand who the franchisor is and, and, you know, and like I said, I'm in the people business. So when I try to understand who the franchisor is, I'm like, is this person going to jive with that franchisor? And if the answer is no, more often than not, I'm like, I don't know that this is going to be the rush, best relationship for both of you, you know, to be honest with you. And yeah. I'm not, I don't know everything. I know very little, you know, and I'm human and I make human mistakes all the time. But, you know, you can kind of get that gut feeling whether we're going to jive or not, whether they're going to work with this, this brand or not. Just on, just based on my interaction with you, and knowing the franchise, or I don't know, I don't, I don't necessarily see it sometimes. You know, I think this advice is actually great advice, not just for selecting franchisees, but uh, as a single person, it's for selecting a, a mate. If someone doesn't have a sense of humor and you don't yeah. feel like hanging out with them for a day, then, you know, you don't want to do business with with that individual so i like i like that criteria now let me understand something the the red chicks you're expanding that you have some big plans a very methodical approach to what you are doing you're going to be growing with multi-unit franchisees is that the plan and if the answer is yes how was it different for you in development working with those versus the owner operator well, I think everybody, you know, is an owner operator, whether you're multi-unit or not, you are owner operators, even the guys that are big franchisors that they, you know, franchisees that, you know, operate a hundred or 200, you know, units, 
Um, they're not in the, you know, every single store, every single day, it's an impossibility, but they're operators and they get what that means. They get the grind, they get all of that. So, you know, um, when, you know, when you buy one unit, you basically just bought yourself a job. And that's really that is. I think the multi-unit guys understand that. Look at, I know what my number is walking in. I know what the equation is. I know if I do X in sales, I know that bottom line is going to be, call it a hundred thousand dollars. So nothing really to get excited about a hundred thousand, but if I have 10 of these things and I've got a million dollars coming in, like an annuity, I've created hundreds of jobs. I'm doing great for my community. I'm all that stuff. They look at that equation and they plop that in there. So when I'm looking at that, want to make sure that what they really want to be in the industry and they understand what that means to be in the industry. They really understand the unit economics of it. They understand the financial model of we're dumping money back into this company because if we're a multi-unit operator, we're building out three stores, let's say five stores. Um, all of that money is dumping back into your company because what you're trying to get to is to be self-sufficient after about that third store. And so that's going to build that fourth store. That's going to build that fifth store. And then you're really looking at it in that scope of those five units. Now they all have to be profitable. They all have to be, have great process, people, systems, all that stuff in place. But you know, it, it's just a different, it's just a different animal. And so in looking at that, you know, I'm looking at, you know, what's the experience, you know, and if they are experienced operators, literally, and I can get to one of their stores, I literally go to their store and see, well, what's their kind of operator they are. If the stores are crappy and they're run shitty, they're going to be a shitty operator. I just, it's just the way it is. So, yeah. But I, I look at I look at that. Then I look at financially. Do they do they qualify financially? So we're setting them up for success. The number one reason, other than pure lack of understanding and experience in the industry, but the number one reasons why restaurants fail is they're undercapitalized. So yeah. you look at them and say, are they capitalized? Am I setting these guys up for success or failure? And if they don't have the capital, yeah, I will tell them. I go look at. It. I think you're probably two hundred and fifty thousand dollars short of of being where you want to comfortably be, I would either establish mm -hmm. another partner or, you know, or circle back to me when you think you have that money, because I don't want to see you fail. You know, I don't, there's a lot of expense when it goes into this thing. So mm -hmm. there's so many different components that we look at. And then we look at the market. Is the market going to support that area? You know, and, and is, is our target market more specifically there? Is our customer base there? It may not be our customer base. So we're right. looking at a lot of different components here where, you know, you would be amazed. We turn down a lot of people just because they, they're they they're just not an area where we think we could probably grow and they just don't meet it financially. Uh, and I, I just, I just, you know, I just don't think it's going to be the right fit. Yeah. Is there a difference in mindset between someone who owns and operates a single franchise versus a multi-owner? A hundred percent. So, you know, when someone knows that they're a multi or when they are a multi-unit operator, they're running an organization. So they have aces in places. They understand what it is to grow and bring a brand. So a guy is doing one store, a single store is going to market that one little store, market that one little operation. And he's going to kind of slowly methodically build that thing out you know, a multi-unit operator that's building out a brand, especially a brand new brand that no one knows about, you know, when they come to a market, they bring it. And what I mean when they bring it is they market. I've had franchisees that have spent upwards of 80 or $90,000 on a three month opening marketing campaign to pound the area that they're coming here, get that store up and running. And what it ends up doing is it ends up actually doing marketing for that second store that's coming down the pipeline mm -hmm. now there's brand awareness and now that third store so you're looking at territories you're looking at the marketing of it you're looking at contiguous territories where you'll be able to maximize that yeah. that marketing dollar maximize all your efficiencies you know all the store unit economics and then the individuals that work in the store so you can cross utilize staff so there's there's actually a methodical way of doing it and doing it right and I you know and and my experience is is there's some franchisors that are really good about that process. And there's some franchisors that don't, they don't even know what they don't know. And they don't do a very good job with that. I would agree. I've been in this business 30 plus years, uh, Spencer, and I, I would agree. And that's why we need people like you with the experience that can work with these emerging franchisors. So they do it right, right. That, that you can bring that wisdom and the, 
the, the whatever stuff you've already been through and share it so they don't have to go uh, through it. So I'm sure they appreciate your, your input. Um, we're kind of coming up on the top of the hour, um, but you're just crazy energetic. Um, I want to know if your wife was going to describe you in three adjectives, what, what, how would she describe you? He is an ass. Oh, oh, that was more. <laughs> it said um, three, Spencer. <laughs> um, my wife, uh, you know, God love her. Um, and I'm, and I'm so grateful for her every single day. I think I have the best wife in the, in the world. Um, you know, she knows that, you know, my, my children are my life for sure. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, so I think the three adjectives, she would say passionate, funny, and, and sort of intelligent, maybe, you know, in those sort, maybe, and I'm not sure where I would fall in as far as the scope, but, you know, I, I would, you know, I would probably say that she would say that, but, you know, but I don't know. I'm going to call know. her. I'm going to call her and we're going to find out. <laughs> you know, what's funny about that. My, uh, so you get, you know, you get older, you, the, the doctor visits change. And so they start asking you different things and all of that. And so my doctor was asking me a number of questions because I've had all sorts of physical issues with working out, just whatever. And so he hands me this pamphlet and he says, I want you to put this, I want you to answer these questions. And then I want your wife to answer these questions and then see what comes back. And some of the questions are, do you become upset when talking about um, politics or, or, or do you emote or do you become upset? <laughs> and you really want to gauge how your wife thinks about you. You give her that pamphlet and then you really know what it is. So. Yeah, it's amazing where the, those close to us, how they perceive us. And oftentimes it's things that we miss about ourselves, you know, or our own gifting, our own calling. Sometimes they see it long before we see it. I tend, I think we tend to be harder on ourselves, um, which is why being in relationship and why relationship is so important, as you pointed out, to encourage one another, build one another up and bless each other with our experiences uh, and knowledge. Um, okay, final question, unless Tracy has something. Go for it. <laughs> Which I'm sure you will, Tracy. Um, what's the future like for you? What's next? What are you gonna run for governor of California? I mean, what are we God, gonna do? We, we, yeah, and we really need that too. You need this help. Is, I just love California. You guys run yeah. it into the ground into the ground i know i know i lived there 40 years in rancho santa fe on uh, north county san diego oh rancho santa fe is beautiful it is and unfortunately yeah. california anyway let's forget politics we just yeah, why would you want to bring that up i don't know because me you mentioned the pamphlet <laughs> <laughs> so the question is what again the question is what's your future like you know, I, I couldn't, I don't know what my future, the future is like. I know that um, I have a very, you know, I have a routine every single day of my life, uh, which is very, you know, important. Um, you know, it's sort of a life and death routine that I do every single day. Um, I know that, you know, I want to work with, you know, a couple, maybe two or three um, emerging brands of, you know, in the, in the for the rest of my career, you know, I'd really like to see, um, you know, I'd like to see, you know, Red Chicks be a billion dollar company. I think that the product is amazing. I think they're very cool. I think they're kind of in their infancy, which is nothing but great run. I mean, there's so much runway. It's scary. Um, you know, I, I, I would love to see that. And I'd love to see that for the owners of of red chicks. I think they're good guys and I'd love to see them have that success. Um, you know, so yeah, I, you know, I think I'd like to probably duplicate that, you know, at least one or two or three times, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and kind of the sky's the limit, you know, my, my road has been anything but this, it's been like this, you know, for the last, you know, long period of time. Um, and so it's, you know, it's really hard to say, but I know that if, if I'm being of maximum service um, to people and myself, 
Um, you know, I know that if I'm, you know, I know that if I'm being a better friend to myself and then the people around me, I know that the sky's the limit with, you know, whatever I can do. So mm, thank you. But moving out of California, I think is definitely yeah, yeah. in the car. I just did. I just did three years ago and I uh, should have done it many years earlier. Where are you now? I'm in Northwest Arkansas. Okay. Mm. Good for you. Cultural shock here. Yeah. So, so where can people find you, Spencer? How can they reach you if they want to get a hold of you? You want my cell phone number? I mean, I told you I was married. Let's write Let's it on pump the phone. breaks, please. Let's <laughs> pump them. Now, they can, you know, they can find me at Spencer at the .com. They can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm I'm pretty accessible. Wonderful. Thank you for being with us today, Spencer. You've you've added a whole lot of light to our day. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, Tracy, uh, any final thoughts from you, hon? Yeah, Spencer, you're a cool dude. Bye. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for having me because most I people just had don't a have me. A little. No, yeah. no, no. Seriously, I have to say that from our pre-conversation and from the interview, I, I think you're a wealth of knowledge. I think you have so many life experiences that people can draw from. Um, I, I just think that there's a really bright future ahead, not only for you, but for a lot of people with red chicks and emerging brands, uh, people who are gonna want to maybe harvest some of that information that you have in your life experience to create some life lessons for themselves and some success in business. So and I made a lot of mistakes you. so I can, I can lay them all out. Here's, exactly. here's all what you do not want to do. The yeah. wise people will learn from those. Right. So thank you for sharing. That's you know Absolutely. very candidly you shared. With and us. thank you for having me. Most people will not have me. So oh, I appreciate on. that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Spencer. And thank you to our listeners uh, today. Uh, for listening in, make sure to like, comment, and share uh, Spencer's interview. Um, and of course, we'll see you next week on another episode of the Franchise Woman podcast, where passion and purpose collide, profits are made, and relationships forged. We'll see you next week. Thank you.